are the classic Sonic the Hedgehog games really that good? I have no clue, because I have never played the original Sonic games. My oldest gaming memory is me sitting on a couch as a child, holding a Game Gear and playing Sonic the Hedgehog, but that never transitioned to playing the classics on the Genesis. I moved on to the world of Nintendo 64 and never looked back. But today, we're going to change that, as I take the time to play Sonic 1 through 3 and Sonic CD for the first time, and find out exactly how good these games really are. I do have a basic understanding of what to expect from each game, thanks to my friend who informed me that... Sonic 1 was almost all the stopping shit. Sonic 2, they went the total opposite direction, and in 3, they were like, okay, maybe we can add a little bit more of the platforming stuff from 1. So let's see how that holds up and hop right into Sonic 1. And there is no place better to start than Green Hill Zone. I mean, what can I say? It's a classic, and has been referenced a million times in pop culture. And for good reason. It's a pretty basic starting zone that gave me some time to get used to the controls and learn the game while also giving me plenty of room to learn how the game would come to screw me over in the future, with falling floors into death pits and springs that launch you straight into spikes or enemies. Nothing I couldn't handle though, and after only a couple of deaths, I was past the first boss and on to the next zone. Marble Zone was the first place I started to notice an increase in the game's difficulty, with plenty of lava to fall into and harder enemies like these dumb spiky worms that I still don't 100% understand how to kill. I die when I jump on them and also spinning into them, and also not once, not twice, but three times I was killed from their leftover body parts, which was insane to me, but I learned, I overcame, and I conquered another Eggman boss. At this point, the words of my friend started to click with me, because I learned the golden rule of Sonic 1 here in Spring Yard Zone. Anytime you see something that looks fun, like a ramp, or a spring, or anything that could make you fast, it is 90% of the time a trap to kill you. I can't even count how many times I would go to roll down a ramp just to find a giant spike ball or a pit of spikes at the bottom waiting to end me. It's frustrating when you have this game where going fast is super satisfying and they could easily give you small areas in each level to let loose, to roll around and just slay, but they never deliver it. All I want is to roll up in a ball, smash through like eight robots in a row, and fly up a ramp before continuing on some other platforming section, but I guess I just have to cope with this. Huh, hey look at that! Hopefully things will start to get better from here, and never mind, it's a water level. I've heard stories about Labyrinth Zone, and if it's anything like the version of Labyrinth Zone in the Game Gear game, we're going to have a problem. I made my way through these three acts with very little resistance, and I was pleasantly surprised by the level design and flow of the zone, since the water forced a slower playstyle than the last couple of zones, which brought the platforming to the forefront. The boss fight for this zone can go suck a big turd though. Thankfully, the next zone was a satisfying break. It took me just 10 minutes to beat all three acts in this zone, and that was since each level was just non-stop speed. And it really satisfied that itch I was talking about earlier to want to go fast. Having this zone just kind of be a fun area to get some breathing room was a warm welcome, especially after the stress that was Labyrinth Zone. But the stress-free time is over because next up is Scrap Brain Zone, the most frustrating level I played. What the f game? Wow, this is this is dumb. This level is the worst level in the game so far. The zone honestly starts pretty interesting with a nice mechanical style to it, moving pistons, fire, rotating cogs, and saw blades all over the place. I was having a great time with all the new mechanics to platform around, but things took a huge sharp turn at Act 3. Welcome to Labyrinth Zone 2.0, the true water level of this game. 
This level just feels like it's been designed to screw you in every way. So many times where I reach a bubble for breath just for it to show up right after I die, over and over and over again, till I wanted to just scream. <sighs> but once you finally make it through that disaster, we have another boss fight, and... Oh. I, I, I guess it's over? I, I, that was... That was Sonic 1. It just kind of ended a little more abruptly than I expected it would. Honestly, for the first game in a series, this was pretty good. There are some hiccups here and there with level design, especially in the later stages. A real lack of speed that I would expect from a Sonic game, and it doesn't give a good flow through the levels, leading you to a climax. With those things aside though, the game is filled with fantastic music and has one of my favorite aesthetics for a game from this generation, with its beautiful color palettes and pixel art. Plus, it has plenty of entertaining platforming and secrets to collect and find. I was also informed by my Twitch chat that there was a special ending if you could get all the emeralds. I sadly wasn't good enough to obtain them all, but I do like that if I want to play the game again, I have a reason to go back, which gives it some nice replayability in the future for me. Real quick, if you enjoy what you're watching, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel, especially now that I'm working on these longer form videos that take more effort to put together. Thank you for your time, let's get back to the video. It's time to move on to our next game though, and we're going to be taking a bit of a weird detour here to talk about Sonic CD before we talk about Sonic 2. Right from the start, we are blasted with the most 90s music I have ever heard. This is straight up the kind of stuff that would blast out of your TV at the start of your favorite Saturday morning cartoon, and I love it. The accompanying animation is also a welcome addition. It kind of already blows me away that this was released in 1992, only a few years after Super Mario World. I had already known that there were obvious connections between Sonic and Dragon Ball Z, but after seeing these animations and images like this, it just drives the point home that much further that Yuji Naka was a huge Dragon Ball nerd, and I love it. Getting into the actual game, I instantly started to notice a huge difference from Sonic 1 with transitions in dimensions, invisible platforms, and more mechanics added to the game, like traveling through time. Since this was my first time playing the game, I didn't really understand what I had to do in the past and future. I just kind of enjoyed these areas as alternate paths to travel while playing the game. I later did some research to learn more about the game and found out that you can do certain things in the past to create a better future and get a good ending for the game, which is pretty damn sweet. I have played a lot of Sonic fan games over the years, and I'm starting to see where most of the inspiration for those comes from. The amount of Sonic fan games that deal with traveling through time in some way is crazy. And I'm starting to understand where those ideas come from now. After completing Zone 1 without too much trouble, we have Collision Chaos next. And boy is this level chaos. Just look at all those color palettes. It almost hurts the eyes to look at. It also has a casino vibe to it with bouncers and flippers around multiple areas. The final boss of the zone is even just a pinball machine you need to escape, which is pretty creative. We also have another water level to deal with in this game, but thankfully this one is surprisingly good. It gives a good amount of time both above and below the water, which helps separate the annoyance of drowning. I'm going to skip over Quartz Quadrant Zone because it's just kind of a level, and nothing really special to talk about happens here, but boy do I have some words for Wacky Workbench Zone. This is probably the worst level I played, even more so than the water levels. There are just so many obstacles in this zone to mess with you. There are a ton of dead ends, and the bouncing floors that launch you back up to where you just came from makes navigating this mess of a level even more painful than it needs to be. Thankfully, I didn't have as much trouble with Acts 2 and 3, so I was able to get out of here quickly and onto the next level, Stardust Speedway. It's a pretty simple level with plenty of areas to do satisfying loops and great speed segments. 
There is also a pretty cool segment at the end of the zone where you need to race Metal Sonic to the end of the level and rescue Amy before Metal Sonic can get to her. It was a challenge and a welcome surprise compared to the previous boss fights. Next up is Metallic Madness Zone, probably the weirdest level I've played so far, with springs on wheels, spinning metal brooms of death, and a whole section where you turn into an adorable chibi Sonic. It also looks to be the end of the level? Jeez. Once again, we have a Sonic game that doesn't give us a huge indication or build up to a climax here, and this one is probably a worse offender than the first game. At least with Sonic 1, I kind of had a hint with the final stage, but this one I was just surprised when I beat Eggman and Amy ran up and the credits rolled. I thought maybe there would be more if I got the good ending, but after looking it up, it seems nothing changes. You just fight the same Eggman boss, but in a good future. I have to say, this was an amazing Sonic game with huge ambitions. Having three different art variations for each level plus different music for the present, past, and future levels, and tons of new game mechanics with great speedy gameplay, has me loving this game and hoping that Sonic 2 and 3 can live up to the hype that this game has given me, especially with Sonic 2 being next. This is probably the game I've been most excited to play out of the classic games, due to all of the praise my friends and others have given it over the years. We start with the classic Green Hill Zone once again, or as this game likes to call it, Emerald Hill Zone, and the first thing I noticed is the plethora of quality of life improvements. Having Tails as a companion to help get to higher hard to reach areas is a warm welcome. The change to Chaos Crystals to have the bonus stage appear at every checkpoint instead of just the end of the stage also made it so I could unlock Super Sonic in this game, unlike Sonic 1 in CD. Please no more bombs. Okay, holy shit, I did it. It's Super Son time, boys. And from what people in my Twitch chat were telling me, if you're good enough at the game, you can have Super Sonic before even leaving Green Hill Zone, which is crazy. On the topic of leaving Green Hill Zone, I do find it satisfying that each zone in this game only has two acts, which speeds things up and makes things feel more seamless in the long run. I may not know a lot about Sonic games, but I have heard a ton of Sonic music through different sources, and Chemical Plant Zone's music is my favorite Sonic track, and getting to play the level the song comes from for the first time was almost like a fever dream. And once again, like in Sonic 1, I'm seeing firsthand what everyone has told me before, that Sonic 2 is the fast Sonic. The number of areas in Sonic 2 that are just speed segments with tons of ramps, loops, and boosters to help you fly and soar through levels faster than ever before is off the charts. Aquatic Zone is this game's version of a water level, and once again, Sonic 2 is bringing in the enhancements by improving what a water level can be. Aquatic Zone, from what I can tell, has this cool mechanic of punishing the player for messing up in the most cruel way. See, when you're playing the level, it all takes place on solid ground. But if you mess up in a platforming section, you are doomed to slog your way through the underwater segment, which is a pretty interesting way to have your players not want to mess up to help them avoid the most annoying mechanic in video game history. Hilltop Zone is when I finally unlocked Super Sonic, and as cool as it was for the first bit, I learned very quickly that Super Sonic can be more of a hindrance than a benefit at times, because it only took me a minute or two after activating it to fly top speed into a hole and get crushed to death. Um, I think I went too fast. And this wouldn't be the only time. There were plenty of times I was going too fast and just flew right off a cliff or died in some other dumb way but it's just so satisfying to fly around super fast, destroying every enemy you touch. Never mind if you can get Supersonic active during a boss fight and destroy them without breaking a sweat. 
The next few zones don't include anything too new or exciting, but I do have to mention Metropolis Zone, because the music in that zone gave me the craziest nostalgia trip. When I was younger, I would play all kinds of Flash games on Newgrounds, and one of my favorites was a rhythm game called Incubus Pulsum, where you smash bugs to different music, and Metropolis' music was one of the songs in that game, and it was the first instance where I was introduced to how amazing Sonic music truly was. Man, I miss classic Newgrounds. Those were the days. Sorry, I got a little sidetracked there for a second, but back in the world of Sonic, we have a brand new gameplay style, where you get to control Tails' plane while riding on it with Sonic. It's a breath of fresh air that I was surprised to see, but still happy with. Small changes or surprises like this can add just the right amount of excitement to a game. On the other hand... Screw Wing Fortress Zone. It's a cool concept, but... Jeez, is it a pain to tell what you can and can't stand on. There were multiple times when I was guessing if I could land on a certain platform or not, and then dying when I ended up falling through them. Having Sonic jump into a rocket ship and fly to space? Kinda made up for it though. The game ends with a fight against Mecha Sonic and Dr. Robotnik, with the latter being a literal nightmare to get through. It's probably the only part of the game I hated. I can't even imagine what it must have been like getting to this segment in the original game with only a handful of lives left, having to beat Mecha Sonic with no rings, and then test out how to damage Eggman without being hit. Thanks to two different video guides, I was able to figure out how to beat this bozo, and thanks to collecting all the emeralds, I was finally able to see a good ending to a Sonic game. Honestly, outside of the final boss, this was my favorite Sonic game of the bunch. Just the speed and quickness of getting from one zone to the next was so satisfying to me. The pacing and platforming were just mm, on point in this game. Never mind all the other great stuff like the art style and music, but let's not count all of our tales before they've hatched. I don't know. We got we still got to talk about Sonic 3 and Knuckles. So roll the footage. Our journey here starts with Knuckles, stealing all our emeralds and leaving us without our beautiful supersonic form as we chase him down through Angel Island. And within just a few minutes of playing, I had already found my first special stage, and retrieved a Chaos Emerald. I'm not going to lie, I thought these were going to be impossible to find, and I would never get Supersonic again. But they were pretty easy to find. I mean, I probably unlocked Supersonic later than most people who know this game would've, but I'm just proud and happy I was able to do it at all. Just like in Sonic 2, each zone is split into two acts instead of three. But in this game, the first act has a mini-boss, and the second act has a boss fight with Eggman, which adds more depth to each zone, making them feel that much more diverse than their previous games. On top of that, the animations and storytelling have just gotten so much more impactful than any of the previous games. Stuff like the forest lighting on fire and seeing Eggman flying through the trees in the background before the fight with him starts. It's small things like that that make the experience so much more engaging and impactful. But take all that with a grain of salt, because Zone 2 is already a water stage, so I may get angry depending how this whole area turns out. I'm just joking. By the third game, Sega had already learned what makes a good water level and what doesn't, and this just shows how masterful they were at creating platformers. A constant rotation of short underwater segments and out of water segments never makes you feel too rushed or panicked, and the fun additions to the level like water slides and hands that grab you while you get up to speed keep everything entertaining. It also shows the amount of work and passion that went into these games, because we are still getting new mechanics three zones in, with these new spinning tops you can ride on and wheels you need to spin on to open doors. 
Each zone in this game seems to have its own little gimmicks that I love to play around with and see what I can do with or unlock by using them. By Zone 4, I finally unlocked Supersonic and in classic Batman fashion, immediately failed with it. Let's go! Yeah, Supersonic! This is so cool. I'm gonna instantly die with this, aren't I? <laughs> There's no way. There's no way that just happened. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love Supersonic. It's like the coolest thing ever in these games. But the amount of times I activate it just to fly directly to my death is just a few too many times. Sonic 3 has pretty much just been one amazing experience so far. So, it's about time to talk about one experience that was very annoying. Both due to my own idiocy, I'm willing to admit, and the game's bad design of not indicating to you what needs to be done. This room right here. I was stuck in this place for a little over 10 minutes. And the only reason I was able to escape this nightmare was because I found a YouTube video explaining how exactly to get out and how to use these stupid platforms. I can't imagine being a kid when this game came out and being stuck in this room for hours or maybe even days before figuring out how to proceed because there is no other way out besides restarting the game. Thankfully, the game rewards you for getting past this zone by allowing you to snowboard as Sonic, which is pretty awesome. So awesome, actually, that it's become a reoccurring thing to have Sonic skate through levels in future games, or even just have a whole side franchise based around the idea. So take that as you will, but for now I'm just going to enjoy myself while I fly through this new zone in style. We're also getting closer to the end of the game since we have just now hit launch base zone and I can see the Death Star, I mean, sorry, Death Egg, right there in the background before my very eyes. This is the exact thing I was mentioning earlier when I was saying that this game is so great at subtle storytelling and I'm all here for it. I quickly blast my way through launch base zone, destroy Knuckles and Eggman with my sweet supersonic abilities, and get ready to head into the Death Egg for a final confrontation with Eggman. Oh. Never, never mind? Um, I guess that's the end of Sonic 3? I don't know, I'm just, I, I guess I'm just kind of disappointed there wasn't a level inside of the Death Egg, but... Who knows, maybe Sonic and Knuckles will make up for that in some way. So let's not waste any time and hop right into it then. We start Sonic and Knuckles in Mushroom Hill Zone, and I enjoy the change in design here from Act 1 to Act 2, with the seamless switch between a lush green and a fall orange. The consistent small changes like these really separate Sonic 3 from the rest of the series. We have also lost our ability to go Super Sonic, and have a new set of emeralds to get now, with bonus rings that bring us to a sweet new hub world where we can select which emeralds you want to get after beating its minigame and I think that's a pretty nice addition as well. Sadly, it's the same minigame from the base Sonic 3, and after doing seven of these already, it's a bit rough knowing I'll have to do seven more, but at least they changed it up a little bit with some new mechanics thrown into the mix. Flying Battery Zone was probably the first zone I felt kind of meh about. It does have some new mechanics and changing sections like the rest of the game, moving in and out of the flying plane, but I just felt bored about the whole section and didn't have a lot of fun making my way through its platforming. Sandopolis, on the other hand, was a blast from the past. I really enjoy Egyptian-themed stuff. Ever since I was a kid, I became obsessed with Mummies Alive, Beetleborgs, and OG Yu-Gi-Oh! I've found Sonic always seems to handle Egyptian-styled levels well. Even most Sonic fan games I play tend to do great Egyptian levels. I don't know why, but Sonic and Egypt just go together well. Lava Reef Zone is yet another beautiful level that pulls a great switch on you, having the first act be in this beautiful lava-filled cave. 
But after beating the boss in Act 1, you can then enter deeper into the cave and get this shimmer of beautiful crystals before you as you explore the depths of the mountain. Eventually, you exit again into a massive lava pool to face off with Eggman. Oh, I also obtained Hypersonic, which I guess is to go even further beyond! I can't be the only person to have ever made that joke, but I just couldn't help myself. It is kind of cool that they added a level beyond Supersonic in this game, just to make it seem more awesome than anything before, but I don't know, I don't see much of a difference besides the teleporting. Next we have our one-on-one -on -one fight with Knuckles, become friends with him, make sweet, sweet love to him, then proceed to just destroy Mechasonic Mark II with Hypersonic, and finally, finally, get the satisfaction of entering Death Egg Zone. As I said earlier in this video, it sucked we didn't get to finish Sonic 3 in the Death Egg, but the build-up to it here made it all worth it in the long run. I mean... To be honest, the level itself isn't that great or anything to write home about, besides the beautiful backdrops on the inside of the Death Egg itself, and then seeing Earth in the background as you explore closer and closer to space. Thankfully, the final boss in this game is much more forgiving than the Sonic 2 boss, and seeing the huge mech chase you down makes for a heart-pounding final fight. The addition of the chase at the end if you unlock Hypersonic was also a warm welcome, it gave me a nostalgic flashback to when I was a kid chasing down Cortex in the final fight of Crash Bandicoot 2. It's just an overall satisfying way to finish off the game. I honestly don't know if I would say I like Sonic 2 or Sonic 3 more. It's weird for me to take a stance on it, seeing as I played Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles as one complete game, when they were released as two separate games. So it feels wrong comparing Sonic 3 & Knuckles to Sonic 2. It's just unfair? If anything, I would have to compare all of them separately, but even then, it's hard for me to decide, since as someone who played both games back to back, Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles feel like something that can't be separated. It's almost something that needs the other to live, or it just doesn't feel complete? I'll end off with just saying this. I love both Sonic 2 and Sonic 3 and & Knuckles, and I don't think there's going to be a fair way for me to decide which game I like more. And that's honestly not a bad thing. Playing these classic games for the first time was an amazing experience that I'm glad I got to go through, and made me even kind of sad. You know, these are great games that I could have grown up with and loved, but I pushed them off for so long as something that wouldn't be as great as they were built up to be, and I feel like I kind of missed out now on that experience. But when push comes to shove, I took the time to go back and live through these games, and it's something I don't regret. It just goes to show that it's never too late to try something new. You never know what may come from it, and hopefully, I'll be singing the same tune after I complete Sonic Adventure 1 and 2. But, that's for another video. Thanks again for stopping by, and I'm glad to be back. Feel free to drop a sub here for some more content in the future, hit the like button, and check me out over on twitch.tv slash badmanreviews. I've been streaming all of my Sonic playthroughs over there, so there's bound to be more. Till next time, I'll see you all around, stay safe, with lots of love, Bye bye